Jason Brooks from Friday the 13th Vengeance, and you're listening to The Movie Raid. It's time for The Movie Raid, and tonight's victim is Jason Brooks, actor that played in Mythos Friday the 13th fan-made film, a.k.a. Friday the 13th Vengeance. Hello. And what's going on? We got this project specifically on the roll on this. I mean, I heard that this is still on uh, Kickstarter. Yeah, this is uh, still on Kickstarter right now. We're in pre-production um, for Vengeance. Um, we started off as Mythos, which was a short film, short part of the 13th film that kind of centered around the, the Mythos of Jason Voorhees and then we got a lot of fan feedback and a lot of positive input and then we also signed on after CJ Graham so we had kind of rewritten it into a full feature based on fan input um, included CJ and the Elias Voorhees story and expanded it and now we are full force with our Kickstarter, which has currently exceeded goal. We're at about $43,000 right now and growing and going strong. Now, you yourself has actually played as Jason Voorhees. I mean, when you perform this iconic character, how do you set all your emotions aside the fact that you're playing as a basically a legendary cult classic villain now? Oh, it is. It's a lot of fun and a lot of pressure. I, I spent probably about 24 four to 30 hours just watching behind the scenes, watching the films, watching documentaries, watching interviews with Kane Hodder, C.J. Graham, Steve Dash, just all the different Jasons to not only watch how they move, but to get in their head and kind of understand why they moved this way and why did they do certain characteristics that they added to that character. And so that way, when I'm on set, I can also kind of go through the same thought process and think about what they would do. And then, of course, put my own take on it and uh, and try to do a combination because this particular Jason is kind of a, a mix of Kane Hodder, C.J. Graham style. I, I sometimes sit there and just I'm beside myself that I get this opportunity to play this character in such a a big production. It, it just blows me away. There's there's a lot of fan made films. I mean, there's a lot of fan Jasons out there that you know that's it's swarming all over YouTube. I mean, there's a lot of them that just want to just play the character and just have some fun, but there's also the point where you kind of have to get serious with it because if you're playing this particular character, there's a lot involved, not just putting on a mask and then just, you know, killing a bunch of people. If this is something more in-depth, especially if you're following Friday 13th, Jason is something a lot more than what he is. He's not stupid, and, you know, I'm sure there are people that probably think that maybe he's mentally challenged. No, he, I don't think he's that at all because he knows what he's doing. He's an expert killer. And we follow that throughout the entire saga of this. Uh, and yes, there's different variations of Jason, and there's slightly different ways of how Jason behaves. But we, we get an idea of what Jason is. We don't really need to have a full backstory, so to speak. Yeah, and that's one thing that the director, Jeremy Brown, um, told me right up front is this Jason is not stupid. This Jason is smart. He knows what he's doing. Um, he's intelligent, and he is pissed off. And so um, that's where we have the, the C.J. Graham. Um, intelligence, where you know he's very methodical in what he does. He he has direction, knows what he's doing, can think things through. And the Kane Hodder aggression, where when he after he thinks it through, he executes. No pun intended. But it's it's definitely more than putting a mask on. You know, I've been playing the character for several years, just at haunted houses and, and different things like that, and have kind of fine tuned some of it myself before uh, I auditioned for this role. Um, but there is, there are a few people who do think, oh yeah, I just throw on the a mask and a costume and pull the knife and you're good to go. But it is it is a big process, especially when it comes to some of the stunts, working with other actors. You know, you have to really be careful and figure out the mechanics of your movements while looking natural and being safe. And there's certain rules and regulations that studios actually put out that allow fan films to be made. So that's why we have the uh, fan film sitting after the title there and we're following all the other rules that put out there. Do you think like with companies that buy up these franchises that they know they have a property, they know they have it secured, and then they know the fact that they're not going to let it go to any, just anybody and of course there's a bunch of legal stuff and rights and, and licensing and all this other stuff, but do you think that these big companies should allow anybody to have more creative marketing with the franchises like this? I do. I think that they should consider it. There's, especially with the advancement of technology, there's a lot of untapped talent out there. Um, um, a lot of great writers, great actors, um, great directors. And I think that there's a lot of people who are passionate in the fans and they're doing the right thing by the fans. I mean, when you make a fan film, you're not allowed to profit on it. You're not allowed to make a dime. It's, it doesn't become about 
making something to make money. You you raise the money so that you could rent lenses and rent locations and rent equipment and um, fly actors in and hotels and food and catering and it, costumes. You know, there's lots of expense with making a film outside of paying people. And we're making this film and a lot of other fan films, you know, they make their films because they want to, because they want to tell that story and pay homage to the character in the franchise. Where sometimes the studios, they want to appeal to the broadest audience and sometimes that kind of veers away from the core of what made the franchise popular in the first place because they're, they're trying to appeal to a wider group, bring, a broader, bring in a broader audience to make more money. And so I think that they should absolutely consider fan films. They, they're made very inexpensively. They're made with a lot of passion. They appeal to the fan base. And, um, and why not allow a segment of that so that it keeps the franchise alive and keeps the interest going? Now, how do you, how do you feel what, when you use the term fan made? Like you see how how an impact comparing to known studios, comparing to what they use with with an existing franchise or any other property, to saying this is fan made, but yet it, it becomes a, a huge success. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting. I mean, I've been noticing that in the past several months. I mean, our film's not even finished yet, and I'm getting flooded with you know friend requests and fan mail and autograph requests. And it's it's really interesting to, to see it's like wow we're just a fan film and there's so much excitement and so much hype around it i'm just kind of beside myself it's a little bit hard to believe sometimes it's very surreal um like i said i've played jason where he's um live kind of you know in a haunted house environment uh working the queue with um with other people around you know just kind of entertaining people in the line and as far as films i've played other creatures in the past that a good friend filmmaker named todd redinas who is signed with trauma and he makes a lot of short films. I've played a couple of his monsters in the past. Um, I've I also played Darth Vader, and I've done that paid uh, through Lucasfilm for several events and television appearances and things like that. And then have done some other acting roles, character acting in the past for some other independent films. Now, compared to, to this current project, I mean, do you think this is more of a, a relief for you in terms of kind of stepping into something a little bit more different? But you're familiar familiar territory, though. Yeah. This absolutely familiar territory for me and it's, it's a lot of fun because that's the, the easiest part is showing up and being Jason having after I auditioned and, and got the role we quickly uh, they quickly learned that I can do more than just show up and wear the costume and so I've been uh, producing as well now and um, doing I made the costume myself um, outside of the, the hockey mask which is made by a, a local friend um, Brian Hargrave from Splat Creations but the rest of the costume is made by me several of the other costumes that you'll see in the film were made by me and then producing just overall it's been night and day non-stop for months a lot of sleepless nights <laughs> and a lot of work and so I've been I've been juggling both producing and acting um, in this particular film which has been a lot of fun but a lot of work and it's been very re rewarding so far do you prefer the balance between the two in terms of acting and producing or do you think that this could be a big uh, payoff in the long run of your career um I haven't actually thought about the career part of it yet. I think I've just been focusing on the, what needs to be done today and um, and not where it will take me yet. There's just a lot of things that, that need to be done to make this film right for us and for the fans. Um, there's a lot to live up to now, and so I've just been kind of thinking about that. But I think in terms of which one do I prefer, I really, really enjoy the acting. And on one hand, there are days where I look at my to-do list and tasks, and I think, Oh, it'd be so nice to just act and just be there and put the costume on and, you know, be 12 hours in this stuffy costume, um, act and, uh, and enjoy that. And then on the other hand, there's parts of me that say, I'm really glad I have this opportunity to be a producer with these guys because I have a say. And being a Friday the 13th fan myself, these guys really, really value my input and have shown me um, time and time again that my opinion is, is valid, that, it, that they respect it. And we all respect each other's opinions and, and input. So being able to add to the creativity of the project has been uh, something that's kept me going as well that makes me enjoy that producer role. In my opinion, is I think a lot of uh, companies should, uh, I'm sure there are people out there that do quite a bit of this directing, producing, and so forth. But I, mean, I, th I think it's a, it's a good key element. Not only, not only that you're kind of reducing costs, but you're also being more of a uh, bigger part, but still equal part to the company and the production and the project alone because you're doing all this stuff. They're, they're eventually going to need you for this or that, and then boom, you can just hop right on and you know what to do. And, um, you know, it, it can be pretty rewarding. It can be a burden at the same time, too. Oh, well, absolutely. But it also helps you invest in the whole production more. You, you know, it really becomes your baby and part of your life. To be able to have so much uh, time effort, blood, sweat, and tears invested in this, there's not a single part you want to have fail. So you can have an eye on everything to make
make sure that um, everything rises together and nothing falls back. And it, with with this project that you're doing, uh, where where time period is uh, is Jason exactly? For those who are not familiar with this particular era of Jason, is this pretty much like almost where uh, Jason lives in a perspective way, or is this kind of like in between time period? Oh sure, this is actually modern time about 30, 32 years after Jason lived. This particular story story somewhat ignores part seven, eight, nine, and 10. We just kind of pick up from the end of part six after Tommy drops him in the water with the rock and we think that Jason's done. Here we are 30 years later picking up the story again. Yeah, and for me, like I, I'm, I've followed every single Friday the 13th film. When it comes to judging uh, characters like Jason, like Michael Myers, like Leatherface and so forth, um, do you think any other character out there that, that are currently still running around in horror films, do you think anyone's ever actually going to match up to these cult classics like Freddy Krueger and everybody else? You know, that's really hard to say. I mean, I've thought about that myself several times. It's like, what did they do next? What kind of character? Because, you know, like you said, we've got Michael Myers and Freddy, Jason, Pinhead. You have these classic characters from back then. And we've had several great characters um, through since then, too. But none of them have really hit that, that same status. And so I wonder sometimes, well, what would it take to have something so iconic? And what could they do differently that would make them stand out? And I just haven't found haven't found anything yet. But I'm sure there's going to be a way, and we'll all be surprised. And the, the the worst thing they do is altering that character. I mean, yes, like you've seen different alterizations a little bit with Michael Myers, especially in the remakes of Rob Zombie. We've seen, uh, of course, Jason Voorhees and several ones. Like we basically see an evolution, really, with uh, Jason Voorhees, uh, with uh, how from you know, a pillow sack to all the way to a hockey mask. And then you see Freddy Krueger. Even Freddy Krueger has several authorizations. His sweater actually changes a little bit on um, how how dirty it is or how it's actually a little darker color here and there, especially his burns. His burns are different textures throughout every movie. But when it comes to doing actual alternization, let's say changing it up a little bit more, it more hurts the the actual aspect of the character itself because when the audience is looking at this, like, what is this? I mean, be, because they want to change it up and make more additional profit off of this character rather than having to try to get another different villain out there, try to make it stand out, but still try to get it up to the same level as these guys have. Oh, sure. And, you know, you have different artistic designers and artistic directors, costume makers on those sets from these films, and so they make their own version of whatever that costume is. And um, But when they do the remakes, the Rob Zombie remake, like you mentioned, with Halloween, um, not my favorite design, and no disrespect to those films or anything like that, but it's not my favorite design. I, th- I felt the original um, was a little bit creepier to me. And I think trying to take it to the next level, and even like the remake of, of Nightmare on Elm Street with uh, the new the new look, there's a new burning effect. I was trying to think to myself, is it that it's different and I don't like change? Or, um, or what, you know, and, and I think it just wasn't the same. It didn't have the same feeling for me. But it did appeal to a younger audience because I know that my son, um, his friends, they do enjoy that movie the best. And so it appealed to them in a way that it didn't to me. So maybe I'm just kind of stuck with the nostalgia of, of growing up with the, uh, the original icons. Uh, in Mythos, it was very much part six, just a little bit aged. Um, and then with Vengeance, we took it a little bit further, aged the mask a little bit more, we figured, you know, he's under the water for 30 years. A little more damage is going to happen, but we didn't go as far as Part 7 with uh, exposed bones or anything like that. But it's different, but extremely familiar. We didn't do a big departure. We didn't throw a jacket on him. We didn't do a, a whole different mask or anything like that. It's the same style mask with a little bit more damage. So, so far we've had some wonderful feedback, which is fantastic because we spent, oh God, I don't know how many times going over that, like, Brian, he made probably four masks for us, the poor guy, before we finally agreed on one. We kept giving him input, and he'd do exactly what we said, and then we'd say, no, not quite, and he'd go back to the drawing board, but um, but I think the mask we landed on was just, I don't think it could be better, and uh, and the overall costume, too, is just, it's just kind of fun to look at, and, and it's familiar, but it's not uh, a copy of, of what was done before. And that's, that's also uh, being repetitive. You think repetitive is becoming uh, more of a problem with a lot of these uh, horror-based icons, not not just the high cons, but even horror-based movies. You think being repetitive is is becoming too much of a problem now? Um, being repetitive, I think in some ways. The way I see that is, there's a lack of creativity sometimes. I think that they say, "Oh, here's a franchise, or here's a, something that will make money. Let's spit another one out," and then it kind of falls flat because you know the reason why 
it was popular because it meant something to someone or to a group of people. But now, just regurgitating it for the sake of bringing it and making it fresh again, it just feels, it, it falls flat a little bit. Repetition, I think, would be okay if it brought an element that kept you, that hit that nostalgia button inside you and brought you something new at the same time that you could be excited about to leave you wanting more. It's almost, you kind of have to steer away from these uh, known studios that have made such such a long line of, of films. But as we go further and further into the future, these companies are further and further just squeezing every single drop out of all these franchises, all these other sequels, and, and then they're going to make a remake later, and then they're going to make a prequel and so forth. And it just gets so tiring and at some point, we're going to need some kind of a refresher like this film that you're doing that is something that is familiar, but with a different element to it, but yet nostalgic in some ways. And Because these are all elements that can also be a little bit of a risk sometimes, but at the same time, it's like it, it can be good if it's done with just the right moment, so to speak. Oh, sure. And, I mean, just like part 9 and 10 uh, are good examples. 9, they try to do a departure. They want to do something different and try to expand on the story without being repetitive. It's like, okay, there's this, are we going to do another Jason movie where he goes to camp and kills counselors? We've already seen that movie eight times before this. So they tried something new and took a chance. Some people like it. It's a good movie on its own, but it didn't feel quite like the Friday movie. Part 10, another example is like, let's take a chance and do something different. You know, it's one of those love-hate things. Some people love it, some people hate it. And I think that what I've been seeing, we've been, you know, reading a lot of the feedback on, on our teaser, on our story concept and what we're doing. And we've seen, overwhelmingly, a lot of positive feedback of, oh my God, here's a story that we wanted to see. It feels like Friday the 13th, and it feels right. It, it does have that retro vibe, even though it's modern time, it has that nostalgic feel uh, and even the characters and the look and stuff is still nostalgic and it feels right it doesn't feel like the studio trying to reboot it to make it darker or to make it more edgy or to make it something that fits into a different bucket but has the staying power of Jason Voorhees character I think we're, we're lucky just because of the fact that you know we're fans we're telling a story that we want to hear and we're lucky that it happens to be the same story that a lot of other people seem to want to, to see as well you know, I like to point out, like, between Jason Lives are, are a little bit slightly different. Like, with, with Jason Lives, I like the fact this is about Tommy Jarvis. This is about the fact that he wants revenge. He wants to just totally annihilate Jason. And I think it's a really good film because uh, I like the fact that Jason Voorhees... I mean, I'm, I'm sorry for those that have not seen this film. Uh, I'm about to spoil something here, so please skip ahead. So, when, <laughs> when he goes to the, the cabin, when Jason Voorhees goes to the cabin, he sees all these children there. But he does not kill any of the kids. He looks at this child almost like as if he's trying to remember a little bit what he was once. And, and I love that part right there. I mean, it's a small moment, but I love the fact because he doesn't kill the girl. He doesn't kill any of the kids in, in the camp. He kills everybody else. But, you know, that's just because he's also smart, too. He's not going to just kill one girl and then just have everybody frantic run around all over the place like that. He, he's a silent killer. Absolutely. Yeah. He doesn't kill um, children, doesn't kill animals. It's mostly just everyone who gets in his way and naughty teenagers. Well, I think like in the early films, Films that he did kill animals, like the the second film where uh, he's you know we already see that he's all grown up and everything. But have you noticed like there are no animals at all that you can see throughout the entire film, <laughs> not even like bugs or nothing? Because I, I sense that when he had his powers, uh, which he already had, he's got that human form. So we see that he's kind of learning. He's been learning the craft of killing already since since you know his mother died, and we see that um, like it's so dead silent everywhere in, in the camp. Like there's there's not a single bug or anything that's even not even birds you don't even hear birds chirping anywhere but i mean we see like i said the elevo evolution of jason that uh the human version looking at him because the second he gets killed that's when his powers really kick in that's when we really see the fact that this guy is unstoppable because uh, you know he does feel pain but he can he can die but he does come right back absolutely but with the cast um, who's in the cast uh, if you're able to tell can you tell us uh whose involvement in the cast so far in this film of uh, friday 13th that's sure. you're involved yeah so um, on Vengeance right now, um, of course, we have myself as Jason. We've got Lexington Vanderberg. She's playing Angelica Jarvis, Tommy Jarvis's daughter. And uh, and her best friend in the film is a great actor named Austin Don Johnson. We also have C.J. Graham, you know, as you know, played Jason in Part 6. He's coming to, to play Elias Voorhees in this film, who's uh, Jason's father, um, who has made appearances in comics and was about to make an appearance at the end of Part 6. But uh, Tommy McLaughlin was not able to get that part filmed for uh, for that particular movie so um and speaking of tom 
Tommy McLaughlin. Um, he's been consulting on our story, and he's a film consultant for us. Uh, we've talked to him already a few times, and he's been wonderful. We have Steve Dash, who, as we know, played Jason in Part 2, the real Jason, um, with, with the sackhead Jason. So we're actually going down to Florida on Sunday morning here, and we're going to go film his scenes. And then we've got a, a large cast of some other people you might know, Diana Prince and Veronica Ricci. We have Bugsy, um, Bugsy Hoffa. He was, if you ever played the Friday the 13th video game, he's one of the counselors in the video game. Ah, uh, nice. So he's in the film. Yeah. Um, he's been with us from the start, from the from the mythos beginnings. All really good people. We have uh, Sanaya Lausis, uh, this really great up-and-coming star. She's a, a young lady who's also going to play one of the Jarvis daughters in the film, and she's a wonderful girl. She's been in uh, several movies with um, Frankie Muniz, another one called Beloved Beast that just got picked up by Lionsgate. We just have a really, a lot of wonderful talent. Ray Hopper, a local Northwest um, film star, just really strong, strong talent. I can't even think of everyone right now. Large cast, huge crew, but yeah, we'll keep announcing new people on our on our F13 Vengeance fan page on Facebook as well. Yeah, so go ahead and plug in any anything that you want to promote with with that, any links, any you know Twitter account, anything. Oh, sure. Right now we just have our teaser trailer. We shot some footage in September, or basically the opening of the film out at a lake out here, and we built our teaser off of that. Um, that's what you see on the, on the Facebook page. That's what you see on the Kickstarter page. You can find F13 Ventures on Kickstarter.com up until... November 24th. And then we have another trailer that we're going to release here in the next couple of months. It's just that we, we don't have enough content from the overall film that justify making a full trailer yet. We want to make sure that whatever we put out is, is quality and it's good and actually takes it to another level. And right now with just the opening scene, I don't think that would be fair to our, our fans to, to put something out just for the sake of putting something out. So we'll get some more footage with uh, Steve this weekend. We'll, we'll shoot some more things between now and the end of the year. And we're going to pick up full production in February. And somewhere in there, we'll produce a, a nice first official trailer. There you have it, everybody. That is actor Jason Brooks. Thank you so much for having me. Always, man.